You're listening to the Swap Society Podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole Robertson. I interview thought leaders and change makers who are working to create a more sustainable and equitable world through fashion, art, and activism. Join us for a dose of climate optimism as we envision a brighter future. Hey everyone, welcome to the Swap Society podcast. Today I'm so excited to be talking with Jillian Clark. Jillian is the founder and CEO of Robero. Hey Jillian, welcome to the show. Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to see you. Yes. Tell us, where are you talking to us from today and where are you from originally? Uh, I'm currently talking to you from Denver, Colorado. Uh, I'm originally from Massachusetts, but I've been in Los Angeles the past 10 years. So kind of been moving around a bit. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And that's obviously where we met in LA. Yes. And obviously we know each other, but for our listeners or our watchers who haven't seen you or heard of your brand before, tell everyone uh, what Robero is. Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, so Robero, our whole mission is to keep textile waste out of landfill. And, you know, we do this in, you know, a variety of different ways, really just go to pinpoint where textile waste is produced um, along the supply chain. And we offer kind of like practical solutions and behaviors for uh, addressing that, whatever that means. Are we recycling? Are we upcycling? Does it, it just basically everything needs to find a new home. So we, we kind of pinpoint the waste. And as we find the waste, we offer solutions and we do this, you know, through our own company, we have like products that we uh, produce and we sell. So, you know, people can kind of get an idea of what exactly textile waste is. You can tactilely like feel something. We also uh, consult for other companies. Um, we have partnerships with like-minded companies and brands that are all kind of working towards the same goal. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a, an umbrella company with ending textile waste as our mission. I love that. So for those who may not be aware of how massive the textile waste problem is. Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, yeah, textile, with the, the fashion industry in general, as I would imagine many of your, your listeners know, is hugely detrimental environmentally, um, you know, human right violations. It's just a, a really devastating industry. And so tackling it as a whole, you know, you're addressing the chemicals that go into the waters, the farmers that are impacted, the garment workers, the, so the one um, specific niche problem I am focusing on is textile waste. And that has become much, much more um, mainstream recently. I think with secondhand clothing, that industry is just booming and continuing to to grow so there's kind of just more of a understanding of the um the inundation with second clothes with fast fashion and how much clothing is produced and countries are no longer accepting our secondhand clothing in the way that they're no longer second accepting our plastic recycling um so that like that in itself is a huge problem but not not only clothing, think about the clothing that's produced. When you cut out a pattern, there are scraps produced and those just get thrown away. And that I worked out this stat um, pre-COVID, I haven't reworked it post-COVID, but there was enough production scraps produced um, annually to cover the state of West Virginia, just the little like scraps. Those numbers wow. have potentially changed, but like that's just to kind of have an idea of just how much of those little bits and pieces just go directly to the landfill. So we're, we're working, you know, with different companies that are innovating solutions for what can we do with that? Can we recycle it? Can we break it down? Um, but yeah, it just textile waste comes in all forms. You think of the fashion industry, you think of the furniture industry, home decor, anywhere there are soft goods, those materials are most likely ending up in the landfill at the end of 
uh, their life. I think some people are like, well, then let's just recycle everything. But right. blended fibers currently can't be recycled. Some companies are recycling, you know, virgin fibers, like 100% cotton. But even that is at a very small scale. I've heard the stat that globally less than 1% of all textiles are recycled. You mentioned how a lot of our clothing is shipped off to other countries and how some countries yeah. have stopped accepting that. Um, you know, there still are some areas that still see an influx of that though. And, you know, now the phrase being thrown around is waste colonialism, which yes. I think is very appropriate. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, but should Western countries be able to just dump all of their unwanted trash and, you know, destroy those other places so that we don't have to look at what we're really doing or the waste that right. we're really creating. An out of sight, out of mind mentality. When you throw something away, it doesn't actually go away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you hear the argument um, that shipping clothes overseas used to be a positive as it you know, did support like local entrepreneurs who wanted to set up their own shops. But that was, you know, that was before this crazy influx of fast fashion where the clothing was actually of quality and people there, there was a value to it. There's mm -hmm. no value to it anymore. So we are literally just sending our trash for someone else to deal with. And it's, it's collapsed, you know, the small economy that did pop up around that quality secondhand clothing industry has now collapsed. So yeah. it's, yeah, just continuing to add to a problem we've created. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's really crazy when you look at the footage of places like the Atacama Desert or Accra and Ghana, and you see mountains of discarded clothing, you know, or yeah. seeing it washing up on the shores of yeah. these beaches and just what it's done to these other places. Uh, it's clear that that's not an option. And, you know, and I think that a lot of people think, oh, well, I don't throw my clothes in the trash. I, I donate my clothes to <laughs> thrift shops. But, you know, that's not a solution either because there's way more supply than demand, less than 20% gets resold. And a lot of what we're mm -hmm. seeing being shipped in bales overseas are actually unsold thrift shop items. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's not necessarily, the, the issue isn't necessarily that lots of people are just throwing their old clothes in the trash, although I'm sure that happens as well. <laughs> yeah. Badly. <laughs> But no, it is. It's it's um, I mean, the the stat in the US alone is 13 billion tons go into US landfills of textile waste. And again, that's not just clothing, that's towels, that's sheets, like all of all of those soft goods. So if that's just in the US, you can imagine these landfills overseas where these bales of clothing is literally just being sent directly there. Because, I mean, anyone who likes to thrift or shop secondhand or like, some, you know, try and resell their clothes at a store, maybe like Buffalo Exchange, know that these stores are no longer accepting anything. It's become very difficult to resell your clothes because they're all inundated. So they're even bailing and shipping clothing overseas because they just have no more room for it. Clothing takes up an enormous amount of space. We just have too much. <laughs> It is as, so you, true. as you well know, <laughs> <laughs> there is no way it needs a physical home to live. And we just do not have the room for it in the U.S. And we're just making it someone else's problem now. There are so many different problems that are intertwined here, right? There's overproduction. Mm -hmm. So we're producing too much clothing to begin with. Brands overproduce. It's part of their business model. And so there's all of the unsold clothing, but also to your point, also all the stuff on the cutting room floor. So you have all of that waste, plus consumers are over consuming, buying mm -hmm. way more clothes than they used to, wearing them for less time, treating everything as disposable. And it's just this cycle, you know, that linear cycle of take, make, dispose is just, it just needs to be phased out completely and replaced with more circular solutions. So I love that, you know, you with your business, you're focusing, you know, on 
on the problem of textile waste. It's a massive issue. So you started out as a designer. Tell us a little bit about how you got into fashion and and how that ultimately led you into, you know, working to solve the problem of textile waste. Yeah, I would be happy to. Uh, like you said, I uh, was a costume designer. That was kind of a joke that I'm like on career number three now. Career number two was costume designer. It's um, what brought me to Los Angeles originally. I was working in Boston at the Boston Ballet and designing for theater. Um, my, I went to college for theater. I kind, I never identified as a fashion person. I was very much, I did costumes. I did character development. I was a thespian. <laughs> <laughs> um, and moved to LA, started working in television and film. And it started to, I remember I was working on um, an ABC show at the time that it really kind of hit me that the the waste on set was starting to really upset me. I think working in Hollywood, there's just like endless money. And, you know, it's a it's an industry that has always been very vocal about, you know, combating climate change. We make the documentaries and the celebrities have their causes and and being on set and seeing the waste that was produced, it was like this is feeling like a little bit of, you know, we're talking out of both sides of our mouth here. We're gonna say the one thing, but we're not gonna actually do it ourselves. Um and so that's kind of where the idea first came from. And my my initial thought was, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a short film, and all the departments will be sustainable. We'll go to each of the department heads, cameras, writers, catering is the biggest one, wardrobe, and where is the most waste, and how can we address it? And that will be the whole like point of the film. Uh, we couldn't get it funded. And, you know, I realized it's like, maybe it's a little ambitious to tackle the film industry, like as a whole. <laughs> and just went back to my own department and looked at costumes and wardrobe. And I really did like a deep dive into researching fast fashion, researching the buying practices of Hollywood, because we we would often buy from Zara. Zara H&M Fast Fashion is like a costume designer's bread and butter. And so we would do these huge purchases, do a fitting and then go back and return I was like, well, that's not a great, if you're shopping from a store where someone gets commission, it's not a great business practice. Um, and so that's kind of where the the like inspiration came from was I didn't really know what this was going to turn into. I just knew this was something I was now very like interested and passionate about mm -hmm. and how it kind of manifested was more of a creative outlet. I just started collecting fabric from shows that I'd worked on that wrapped that would otherwise be thrown away mm -hmm. and started making products. I signed up for a couple um, fair like artists and fleas in Venice and uh, unique LA and those sorts of, and it just, the, the, I was amazed at how excited people were for these kind of products. I was making t-shirts and jackets and bags, like cute, like one of a kind pieces. And it's kind of since grown from there. I've kind of let the company grow organically. And I've kind of learned that if you listen to your supporters and consumers, like you'll, you'll figure out what works, what resonates with people. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so Roboro kind of has been a, an ever evolving thing. We've started as a sustainable short film turned into an upcycled product, you know, retailer, and now have kind of grown into a whole textile waste solutions agency almost. But that's, uh, yeah, it's been quite the evolution. <laughs> <laughs> that's so exciting though. And, and are you still working as a costumer at all? I am. Yeah. It's, um, it's still, you know, Robro is still very much a mostly like one woman show. And so I still do the production work. I, I love the production work. It's very time consuming. So it's hard to do and run a company. Um, but no, currently what I'm doing in Denver is actually designing uh, an indie feature film. So that's been really, that's been really fun. Um yeah, it's still it's still something I enjoy doing. I I think I got a little burnt out on the industry in mm -hmm. LA. 
and have kind of taken an opportunity to to step back, focus a little bit more on on Robro. But this project was kind of just kismet, like one of those opportunities that like falls in your lap, and you're like, this is this is what I got into this industry for. So mm-hmm. I'm very excited for it. So it is still very like. Um, creatively fulfilling and I just approach my work differently I don't shop at fast fashion stores anymore Uh, I make a point to kind of research local sustainable brands like I really want to funnel these big Hollywood budgets into the brands that should be celebrated Mm -hmm. that's so cool so So you talked about character development when you're doing your (laughs) costume design work Do you have any tips for people who are maybe struggling with figuring out what their personal style is? Because I feel like, you know, you're constantly creating style for different characters, right? And so what's, is there a formula or is it just kind of instinctual? How how do you work? So it, it's funny. It's that I think anyone who is a designer, whether you're a, a graphic designer or a, a floral designer, anyone who kind of you're you're cre- crafting something, there is this kind of inherent feeling of like, okay, now it's right. Like that, like it's it's almost working, it's almost, and like it's it's frustrating, even as a costume designer, the number of times where like I don't even get it quite right. It's like it's so close, but you just change that one. It's usually like a silhouette change or something that just everything kind of falls into place. Mm. Um, But as far as for like people's individual styles, I, so like my process when I'm talking to an actor, for example, on this film is I will pull together and I, I do this. I've, I helped, I help a lot of my friends like thrift or, go through their closets and put together, like, I really love going through my friend's closets when they're like, I don't know, I don't, I don't care about what I wear or I'm stuck in a rut or I just, you need to get someone else's eyes on it. Mm -hmm. And you can really like start out. I'll start by kind of creating like a mood board, a Pinterest mood board of what, you know, you'll talk to the person. What is it you're wanting to put out in the world? You know, you're Mm -hmm. talking to the actors who is this character? Who is this character? Who have you created? I've created one person based on the clothes, but you as the the actor who's portraying them, who have you created? Who, where do they shop from? Where can they afford to shop from when I'm working with clients or, or friends is okay. Let's start with like your, I don't want to say, I want to start with the budget. The mood board is usually like, we're not going to think about money and it's just, what is the the energy you're wanting to put out in the world. Mm -hmm. We kind of go through there and then eventually you kind of narrow down because everyone has a preference of like, I like pants or I like a skirt or I like things fit this way. So you can kind of get those personal preferences, Mm -hmm. but it becomes very intimate very quickly because you clothing is very intimate. Everybody's got different insecurities about their bodies, different things they like to highlight. Um, things that they often won't really talk about. And so you do learn very quickly of like, I tend to wear things like this to cover up this or to highlight this. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the moment where I find you can really help hone in a personal style Mm -hmm. because often the insecurities are maybe getting in the way of what that like kind of final energy you're wanting to give to the world. Um. And it's not necessarily like a certain garment or like, like, I wish I could say like, everyone just needs these basic (laughs) wardrobe items. It's so personal. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really enjoy moments where I'll kind of be, and I'll, I'll usually have to push people. It's like, just try it on. I know it's not something you would normally try on, but from everything you've told me about, you know, you're wanting to be more professional or you're wanting to be more relaxed and you're wanting to like feel more confident. I think this piece will really, and people have genuinely like cried uh, in moments of like, how did you, how'd you do that? <laughs> like you just need someone to kind of like recognize kind of those insecurities and then find a way to show that this can actually be a, a positive. This could be something we can highlight and be proud of. And you'll watch people just like light up. It's the same with an actor when they come out of the fitting room and they finally see the character. Mm. And you're like, ah, there she is. 
Like mm-hmm. it's a really, it's a fun moment and it's all, it's like a feeling and it can take a long time. I warn my friends when we go through their closets, I'm like, we're going to like, it's not, it's not a quick process. Fittings are several hours long with actors and it can, mm-hmm. it can be like an endurance challenge to find it. Cause you're going to go through a lot of like, no, no, no. But then when you find it, you're like, whatever this is, this silhouette, this combination of garments, what is it that I like about this? And mm-hmm. how can I replicate that in different outfits, different scenarios, you figure out what it is. That's so cool. I think that, you know, costume design is a really good example of how clothes matter so much to how we're pre- how we present ourselves in the world, because it's essential to the visual storytelling that happens in something like film or a TV show. It's really interesting way to kind of think about the psychology of dress and, you know, why we like what we like. And and I think that working with stylists for people that have the opportunity to do that, it can be so good because to your point, you're saying you're pushing people a little bit sometimes in a direction where they might not normally go. I think that sometimes we need that with our wardrobes. We need a little yeah. bit of somebody else's third party perspective to say, oh, I think these things together on your body would look amazing and, you know, kind of help you oh. hone in on that style or whatever. Yeah, I just need someone to give you that like very, but like a very comforting nudge out of the comfort zone. Cause mm-hmm. Clothing, it can be such a thing where like people can have an adverse reaction. You don't want to push too far because then yeah. like, then you shut down. It's like, no, 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 we're just going to do like little like baby steps. Does this work? <laughs> Does this work? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Have you watched Succession? I think I finished season one. I need to watch season two. One of the actresses from Succession is actually in our film. So that's oh. why I've been watching it. Yeah, Natalie Gold. Very cool. Yeah. I've been seeing a lot of articles swirling around about the costume design specifically <laughs> for that show, which made me kind of think of it since, you know, our com- the way our conversation is going. Yeah. And I read one of the articles and, you know, because there's this whole concept of quiet luxury. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is trending in a lot of ways, right? This idea that, you know, these ultra wealthy characters, they're wearing very expensive, but very subdued, neutral, basic pieces, nothing flashy. And then the characters that aren't from that money, but they're working around those people, you know, all of these details about like how some characters they're wearing something too garish or too bold, or they look like they're trying too hard. There's a whole scene in the current season where one of the characters is making fun of someone's handbag. The current season of the show has kind of created a lot of conversation around the power of dress and what different things signify. If you're trying to project wealth, for example, you know, logos aren't really the way to go. But not mm-hmm. everybody might realize that. And then they wind up standing yeah. out thinking like, oh, I have this like fancy luxury label or whatever. It's really interesting. Made like a fashion faux pas at that point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's great that there's more attention being paid to how uh, television and film impacts trends specifically in fashion and I know this is kind of an ongoing challenge for the costume designers guild Mm. because I mean how costume designers are now partnering with different fashion brands I mean after after Mad Men came out um the the designer partnered with Banana Republic uh I believe the the designer right now of Bridgerton has partnered with like a jewelry designer kind of making so it's this art imitating life life imitating art Mm -hmm. thing and costume designers what their battle is is holding on to the credit for their design specifically when it comes to things like um Halloween costumes right I worked on Ghostbusters a number of years ago and those are now like iconic costumes and so cause like these things that costume designers create, but it then has a global impact. That's mm-hmm. kind of an ongoing challenge with the guild. The way costumes can, how entertainment 
can impact uh, consumer trends. I mean, I've seen a bunch of articles like Gucci's, you know, stocks have gone up since this new season season of succession has come out. Um, the last show I was working on before I left LA for All Mankind, it was an Apple Plus show. And it was um, about sending people into space and setting up uh, habitats on Mars. Our costume designer, Esther Marquis, was contacted by a uh, contractor for NASA because they needed a new spacesuit, essentially. And they saw For All Mankind and they loved her designs. And now Esther is traveling around doing press with NASA designing NASA's new spacesuit. So it was like, so it's really, entertainment can have a huge impact on like the real world. And it's, I'm glad to see that that's becoming more and more recognized. Yeah. It really like, entertainment plays a huge role as much as people can say like, oh, it's TV or it's movies, it's celebrities. It drives the market. Absolutely. Well, and I think that that can be good and bad, right? I love the creativity of all of it. But if it's if it's ultimately going to drive like overconsumption, then it's like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. OK, slow down. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Like, you know, so I love that you know, you're focusing now more on sustainable brands and secondhand mm -hmm. when you're doing your work as opposed to just kind of running to the fast fashion shops. I will say that we have had a number of, I mean, we're based in LA. We've had a number of designers that have had memberships with us. Sometimes things even come in where someone on the team was like, I saw this tag and it said Scorsese on it. And it's like, oh yeah, those must have been- Came from on, a movie. On a Scorsese movie because it had like a special tag in there. And it's like- uh Cool. Yeah, but I, love, I love seeing that clothing is is finding a home, you know, through yeah. something like swapping or, you know, it's it's nice to see that it's at least being reused because, you know, these garments aren't being worn out. They aren't being used to their full lifespan. And so it's it's like, oh, yeah, there's also that kind of waste where, you yeah. know, once it's been worn on set, it's not like that's going to get returned to the shop. And then, you know, designers have all of this excess stuff. I mean, I remember I did a commercial. This was a really long time ago, but I was in this commercial. And I remember just for me, one person, they were trying to figure out what I was going to wear. I didn't get to decide, you know, they just dressed me however they wanted to. And I, and I didn't even like what they chose for me, but it doesn't matter. Right. Like I didn't really have a <laughs> like, say, but I yeah. remember they had so many things that they had pulled for me to try to then have the client look at and, you know, choices that had yeah. to be made, et cetera. Um, but then I remember at the end, they were like trying to get me to buy the stuff. They were like, do you want to buy your outfit? And oh, I was wow. like, Raisin. And I was like, like, no, <laughs> it's not really my I style. I will take it if you want to give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, commercials, especially because you have so many, you've got the, the client, you've got the agency, you've got the production company. There's so many people that commercials, when I style commercials, you need racks and racks of options just because yeah. everyone's going to have an opinion but no los angeles there are warehouses all around the city of either rental there's a lot of rental houses so a lot of clothing the production you do rent and i will say productions are getting better and better about you know when they wrap out finding um stores to donate to i've directed a number of productions to the downtown women's center um but yeah, warehouses of clothing, that's either projects that have been wrapped. And when you wrap a project, you might need to go back and do reshoots. It might come back from another season. Mm. So you, you inventory everything, you very clearly label it, you box it up and you put it in storage. And then the production company decides what to do with it. For all I know, you know, most of the shows I've wrapped are probably still sitting in storage somewhere in and around LA. So it wow. is, yeah, just enormous. Uh, like I'll share on on Robro's page sometimes when I'm working on set, like a, what a wardrobe trailer looks like. And it's mm. basically just like a mobile office with inventory that we just kind of have on hand. And some productions have multiple wardrobe trailers. And there are 
you know, hundreds of productions around LA, around that. It just, just to kind of get the idea of like how much clothing there is, like how much we are consuming. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to consider. Okay. So I know this can be a <laughs> tough question to answer, but I always love a good fashion love story. Fire away. <laughs> do, you, do you have a favorite piece in your closet? And if so, what is it? And what do you love about it? I do. Uh, I saw a question immediately. It was like, oh, well, it's my, it's my cashmere coat. Uh, I got a jacket. It was a, a birthday gift to myself two years ago now. Okay. And it's a a camel cashmere jacket, probably down to like my shin length, drape front. It's it's really nice. I got it from a secondhand store in Worcester called Sweet Jane's Consignment. It's I was looking for a jacket that I could wear out over a nice outfit I could also like throw it over a sweatsuit and it just has that like LA casual look mm -hmm. um and I've lived in this jacket for the past two years to the point that the pockets I've noticed recently are starting to rip mm. which in cas cashmere ripping is heartbreaking so I'm gonna do like some sort of visible mending on mm. both pockets you know, when I have free time. So I've loved the jacket. And now I'm excited to figure out what that kind of visible mending will be on said jacket. <laughs> I love it. Visible mending is so cool. And you're the right person to have that because <laughs> you are a queen of visible mending. Uh, speaking of visible mending, so there are different mm -hmm. types. And I know that you've done a lot of denim, in particular, the sashiko mending, which is a Japanese yep. style. Tell, tell us what that is a little bit and what that entails. Yeah. So our, our denim repair lab is a really great service that's been gaining popularity now, um, a mail-in denim repair. So they can mail your jeans, your jean jacket, and we offer a couple different kinds of mending, invisible mending, patching, or yeah, the, like the Sashiko or the Boro, which is visible uh, embroidery. Mm. And it is... So Sashiko is usually in a certain pattern. It's very decorative. And the idea is that it strengthens the fabric. So you've mm. got the, the damaged fabric and you include a layer of, you know, reinforcement. And then this decorative stitching almost acts as like quilting. So it strengthens mm. it. And then borrow borrow men mending is similar in that you use kind of the same sort of thick threads, usually a traditional like thick white uh cotton thread but that borrows more of like a patchwork and then you do the visible stitching along the edges it's become mm. very like trendy right now um okay. i get a lot of requests or i've been getting more requests recently of doing these like very elaborate embroidered um jeans and that is now the aesthetic that there's all this visible mending and embroidery and it looks kind of hand done, but it's very like visually pleasing. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's been a fun and that's what most, most people that reach out to the denim repair lab are wanting the kind of more special visible mending. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's a trend that just needs to keep growing um, because it's, it does, I think, make the garment more beautiful and more unique and more interesting. And also there's this mindset shift of, oh, this garment tore. And instead of saying, oh, I have to get rid of it and get something new. It's like, oh, I can keep wearing that. And yeah. the mend actually makes it cooler. <laughs> exactly. It's like, now it's it's continuing that garment's life cycle. It's added this kind of story. You'll remember like, oh, it, you know, it started to wear through. And then I I invested in this really cool like repair that now it's exactly like you said, it's even better. It's yeah, yeah. I really it's kind of the, you know, one of our we've got our six tenants for the company and our uh, the sixth one. They're kind of our brand pillar. But one of them is infinite story in that all of our our products, the solutions, kind of everything that we're, we're outputting. Mm -hmm. The goal is for it to be a, you know, circular design, a closed loop. You can just keep reusing, recycling, upcycling, that it's a sustainable process system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. What's inspiring mm -hmm. you these days? Uh, honestly, I, I, the film that I'm working on, 
has been, it's been really um, refreshing. Like I said, I think being in LA, I was feeling a little burnt out and a little jaded um, and knew I just needed a, a little break away. And so it was the humor of it was not lost on me when I came through Denver. Like, would you work on a movie? I was like, <laughs> I'm trying to get away from this. <laughs> <laughs> but I really feel like I'm working with a team of like-minded filmmakers. Most of the people on the team, you know, spent the majority of their careers in LA and have kind of, I think in similar ways became dis disillusioned for different reasons. So being with a crew that is wanting to, they're very passionate about Denver and Colorado, this group, they're, they're locals, they're wanting to, you know, be able to produce quality films outside of Los Angeles. And I, you know, I'm all about localized industry and economy, and I'm, I'm wanting to go home to Massachusetts and love that idea. So I feel it's very inspiring to be around people that are in this industry that have had the same kind of frustrations with the industry, but then mm -hmm. have sought out these solutions um, and are now, you know, working to make a film together. So that's been really, it's been really nice. <laughs> that's awesome. And, you know, in this time of climate anxiety, which <laughs> so <laughs> many people rightfully have, uh, you know, what's keeping you feeling optimistic about the future? Yeah, this was another one. As soon as I saw the question, I was like, oh, uh, Gen Z and the younger generations, honestly. Um, I, I've i partnered, Roboro has partnered with Cal State Northridge. I'm talking to a couple schools in Massachusetts for when I get back there. Uh, I recently was interviewed by a high school senior who's doing his capstone project on the dangers of fast fashion. Uh, when I was in high school, I loved my fast fashion. <laughs> uh, so just like seeing that shift in this younger generation, I feel like they have not, um, they're not as, to them, uh, capitalism has kind of just always been like a failed experiment, right? They've never, they don't have the same like blinded, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they aren't as blinded by the like financial gain or greed that kind of has allowed these corporations to have the power that they have. Um, they, they understand that like financial gain is not the only measure of success. You know, their, their generational icons are Greta Thunberg and Billie Eilish, you know, both big activists. Um, they're growing up in a world where divisive labels like gender and sexuality are, um, they realize they're just social constructs that can hurt people and they're open-minded, they're more empathetic. And these are the people who are gonna eventually be our, um, our politicians, our CEOs. And that's very, that's exciting for me to know that, you know, things don't happen overnight. They don't, they also don't happen, you know, like again, in high school, I was shopping fast fashion and now high schoolers are are warning against the dangers. Like if that has happened and I'm going to age myself 20 years, um, what, you know, what is it going to look like, you know, when you and I are like old and gray and these different people have come through and made these changes that, you know, you and I are, are fighting for right now, they're going to have more uh, innovation, more technological advances, um, and that, that's really kind of what's giving me hope on the days where I feel like I'm just like spinning my wheels. Every time I hear another story about AI, I'm like, why, I don't, why am I doing this? But it's, you know, things don't happen overnight and seeing the, the younger generation already starting to like run for, you know, run for office and mm -hmm. be in positions of power kind of that's that's what's given me hope right now. Yeah, I think that the way that technology has changed, you know, over the past decade, you know, or two, you know, there was no social media when mm -hmm. I was younger. And, right. <laughs> you know, that's something that came much later. Um, 
I think it's really just given more access to information. It's given, you know, there are pros and cons to it, obviously. Yeah. But yeah. I think that it really has changed the way that information is disseminated. In the past, it was really, you know, TV, radio, newspapers, magazines. Yeah. And it was, it was not, you know, everyday people didn't have as much access to being able to spread information. You right. know, now we have social media, we have podcasts where, you know, anybody can produce a show and put information out there. Like there, there are so many ways, you know, blogs and what have you, where, you know, you really can talk about things that you're working on um, and causes that you care about and reach so many more people than before. Yeah. So I yes. think that that's probably one of the biggest differences because I know that, you know, when you were younger or even when I was younger, um, we didn't have as much information. No. I don't, I don't think that, I think that if I had, if the, this type of stuff was around when I was young, um, I think I would have been really like turned on by some of this information you know like I remember yeah. this was this was so long ago but I remember when move on started I'm really probably aging myself at this point because, <laughs> you're in good um, company <laughs> anyway uh but um I remember the way that it would work and I did this once was you know I had an event they would get people to have events in their homes and they would send out they sent out a dvd and I had a screening at my house and a party where it was like people that I knew who I invited and then people that I didn't know who came and then randomly somebody that I knew, but didn't realize it was me hosting it that showed up, you know, or whatever. And it Worlds was like, colliding. <laughs> but it was so much slower, right? Like the way right. that it, but I think that things like that still have a lot of power. I'm not saying that we shouldn't still gather oh, and get our communities together to kind of talk about things that we care about or promote causes, but it's like now everything is digital and it's streaming and here's a link and it can be virtual and, you right. know, it's uh, so much more reach. You've yeah. gone from like the one way of communicating that to a hundred different ways of communicating, which yeah. can be a blessing or a curse, but yeah. you know, that's a whole yeah. nother conversation about social media. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that seeing young people getting out there, expressing their values and what matters to them, whether it's climate or gun control or any other yeah. number of things that are going on out there. Uh, I do. I agree. I think it's really exciting to see that and to see younger yeah. people making a difference. And I think it's also like the way in which it's being done. And this was kind of what I was saying earlier, where like, where I kind of referenced the like capitalism kind of being like a failed experiment. I feel like they're approaching this there when they are vocal or outspoken or take a stance against something. It is very like, confidently defiant of just like this is wrong as opposed to I think maybe like with with my generation a little bit with millennials where we're really appealing to people's like altruistic real like doing it for like the which of course we're all doing this for like altruistic reasons but also just wanting to appease to people's like softer side maybe like this is what we this is what we should do for the planet this is what we should do for each other and I feel like younger generation is maybe more pissed off and so there isn't as much of that like appeal for like but mother earth it's like no 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 this is a hundred percent the right thing to be doing and the fact that you're not doing it uh, it's like they're so aware of the fact that it, how ridiculous it is that it's children telling adults mm. how to be responsible. And I really appreciate that. Like I said, like confident defiance of just like we are so aware, like just can see the situation very clearly. Yeah. Um, which I appreciate. Well, and I think, you know, I mean, obviously, the this would be a whole nother episode or there are even podcasts <laughs> dedicated to talking just about capitalism and it's many, <laughs> many problems. Yeah. Um, but I think that something that really stands out to me 
just about it in and of itself is that the concept of capitalism really requires infinite growth, infinite exponential growth. And we live on a planet with finite resources. And so we can't continue to exploit the environment at the rate that we are. Um, It's, and when I say that it's not sustainable, I mean like, you know, human extinction is on the table as a real possibility. We're already in the middle of a mass extinction. We can't just keep taking, taking, taking. And it's crazy, we're taking these resources, you know, it's the snowball effect, right? More and more and more and more and more. But it's way too much, and and it's part of what's creating this waste problem that we have. You know, we're not consuming in a way that makes sense based on just like what is actually available to us. We do not have infinite resources, whether it's growing crops, you know, to make cotton or other natural fibers, you know, land use is a is a concern, you know, how, how healthy is the soil? Are we going to be able to continue to grow these fibers? Or do we need to focus more on growing food instead of clothing? And it's like, wait, (laughs) we're throwing all of this clothing into landfills or burning it. It's crazy. Yeah, it's just such an overwhelming problem that like, I was actually just talking about this with a friend yesterday, where until the really systemic societal problem of overconsumption is addressed, everything else that we're doing is really just a band-aid. Mm-hmm. And it's better to have a band-aid than to not address it at all. But like in a in a perfect world, Robro wouldn't need to exist. Like we just that wouldn't be an an issue. And you know, I love seeing this trend of de-influencing, you know, on TikTok, people encouraging people to to buy less, to use what you already have. So it's, it's nice to see that mentality shifting. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been really following uh, the city of Amsterdam. They have this city wide waste reduction initiative um, where they're going across, basically changing the mindset Mm -hmm. here. They're, they're setting up different repair hubs for clothing. They're making uh, like, community, you can borrow power tools or vacuums, things that we don't all need to own Mm -hmm. and just kind of setting up those hubs around the city. So you do see the mind shift happening uh, around the globe. And I just hope that that just continues to be the track because until the overconsumption model is addressed, we're going to be fighting a, a continual uphill battle. Yeah, I mean, and it it does require a massive mindset shift because the way that the system of capitalism is set up doesn't really allow for that triple bottom line. It really is all about money at the expense of people and planet. And it needs to be, okay, sure, have a business, make money, but don't exploit the planet, don't exploit your workers and do it in a way that is in line and reasonable with like living within the parameters of what we really have to work with here. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And with the growth of all the different like ESG regulations like that, again, it's, it's slow and steady change where I Mm -hmm. think these things and it's the, the unfortunate truth of, again, the capitalist like world is you're, if it's not profitable, it won't happen. Corporations will not adopt it. And the only way it's going to become profitable is if consumers demand it more Mm -hmm. and demand it being better practices, Mm -hmm. consuming less, using better materials, whatever it is that we're needing to change. Like ultimately it's the corporations that will need to do it. Mm -hmm. They will only do it if it is financially beneficial to them. and consumers drive the market. So that's just why I'm just the, the slow and steady seeing all the, there's lots of different things that need to happen for that societal shift 
to, to change. I mean, all around the world, people, you know, we consume differently in different cultures and we consume for different reasons, personal reasons, you know, societal reasons. Mm -hmm. So that's not um, a simple thing to tackle, how to yeah. address that in all the different ways that we consume. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> on that note uh, yeah. <laughs> how can people find you and learn more about the work that you're doing yeah uh so our website is robro6 the number six.com for our six tenants which i said earlier are our brand pillars um our instagram tiktok facebook is at robro official okay um if you sign up for our newsletters, that's kind of been the most reliable place for, for our updates right now. April is a really big month for us. As I'm sure you know, it's Fashion Revolution Week. Um, it's our sixth birthday. Happy uh, birthday. Thank you very much. We launched uh, on the anniversary of the Rana Plaza mm -hmm. factory collapse. So that, we, that was what inspired company in the first place. So... We've got the 10 year anniversary of that and our sixth birthday. We have a clothing swap coming up on Earth Day in Los Angeles. Nice. So yeah, sign up for our newsletters, follow us on Instagram and get all of the, the fun updates. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story. And it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank uh, you so much. It was great being here. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for listening to the Swap Society podcast. Swap Society is an online clothing swap for women and kids that makes it easy and affordable to mix up your wardrobe sustainably. We're a growing community of women across the USA who are creating positive change by swapping our clothes and slowing down our fashion consumption. We would love to swap with you. If you're interested in joining, you can sign up at our website. Learn more at www.swapsociety.co. That's swapsociety.co. You can find the show notes for each episode on our website. Please get in touch with us on social media too. We're on Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and YouTube for the video version of this podcast at Swap Society. Music is by Joel Korlitz and yours truly. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Please help us spread the word by subscribing, leaving a rating and review, sharing on social media, or simply telling a friend. We really appreciate your support. Have a wonderful day. And remember to swap before you shop. <laughs>